Hello everyone, this is Robert Heath. I'm a Lambay Distinguished Professor at North Carolina State University. I'm pleased to be giving the introduction to this presentation on our paper, Adaptive and Fast Combined Waveform Beamforming Design for Millimeter Wave Automotive Joint Communication and Radar. This paper was co-authored with my former PhD students, Dr. Preeti Kumari, who's now a senior engineer at Qualcomm, and Dr. Nitin Jonathan Myers, who's an assistant professor with DCSC in the Delft University of Technology. So I'd like to kick off this presentation with some motivation for why millimeter wave joint communication and radar. So joint communication and radar enables hardware and spectrum reuse. So you use the same physical resources and spectral resources to do both communications and sensing. You can do joint communication and radar at, you know, in any particular frequency band, but it's especially attractive at millimeter wave bands because you could take advantage of the higher bandwidths available and also the larger array apertures. So this helps both in terms of getting high data rates for communications, as well as improving the ability to, to do localization and Doppler estimation using radar. Now, one of the main challenges with joint communication and radar is that um, the, the fundamental objectives of each is, is different. And a lot of the prior work on millimeter wave joint communication radar is leveraging the millimeter wave communication link, which is directional, and thus it has a narrow field of view. And in our work, we design space-time waveforms to achieve a wider field of view with millimeter wave joint communication and radar. Now some background on prior work on millimeter wave joint communication and radar. So there's a lot of prior work that combines communication and radar in different ways. We can break them up into two categories. One is radar-centric designs where communication information is modulated on top of a waveform that's good for radar. And there's also communication-centric designs where radar functionality is obtained using the communication waveform, for example, the echoes of the transmitted waveform. So in this work, we consider a communication-centric design with an analog beamforming-based architecture. Now, prior work has proposed two kinds of strategies for sensing with the analog architecture. So there's uh, a beam scanning approach, which is widely used in millimeter wave communications, well, and random antenna switching with, with phased arrays. So there's a lot of overhead associated with the beam scanning as you need to sweep a relatively narrow beam over a larger area. But the approaches based on techniques like random antenna switching suffer from poor SNR because you're not necessarily using all of the different antennas. And, and our approach overcomes these methods. So we're going to present a, a waveform that is able to achieve a faster search time and overcomes some of the limitations of the prior work, especially that those based on the antenna switching methods. So the rest of this presentation, we're going to go through the main contributions of this paper. So in our first contribution, we designed beamformers at the JCR transmitter that allocate a fraction of the available power for communication and the remaining amount of power for radar. So Preeti will discuss how to construct such beamformers with phased arrays using the gertzberg saxton algorithm. That's our first contribution. Second contribution, Nitin will discuss how to use these beamformers in a special way to estimate the angle and the Doppler of targets with phased arrays. Specifically, he'll talk about a space-time sequence design problem to optimize a compressed sensing matrix and to get the subsampling scheme shown over here. And finally, Preeti will talk about our optimization problem that allows us to achieve trade-offs between communication and radar performance, and she'll also discuss the simulation results. Now we're going to move to talk about the joint communication radar system model and the beamforming design problem. Thank you, Professor Heath. So let's look into joint communication radar system model and waveform beamforming 
Now we consider the use case where our source vehicle sends a common millimeter wave JCR waveform to communicate with the recipient vehicle while simultaneously using the received echoes from surrounding targets for automotive radar sensing. The use of a common waveform enables hardware and spectrum reuse as mentioned by Professor Hill. We consider closely separated transmit antenna array and receive antenna array mounted on both source and recipient vehicles. For simplicity, we assume that the antenna arrays are uniform linear arrays with n elements each. We assume a phased array architecture with B bit phase shifters at the transmit and receive. The goal of sensing in joint communication radar is to estimate the Doppler and AOD pair associated with targets in every range bit. For this purpose, let's look at our time domain, packet structure, and spatial beamformer design. We consider a transmit waveform structure with M equispaced frames separated during a CPI, that is a current processing interval, of T seconds. Each frame consists of a preamble part and communication data segment. We assume that the training sequences in these preambles possess good correlation properties for communication channel estimation and radar sensing. We also assume that the training sequence length is an integer multiple row of building block size L block. Goal sequences can be used to construct such preamble structure with arbitrary row and preamble length L block. Now to unambiguously estimate a maximum relative target velocity, Vmax in a CPI, the mth frame is considered to be located at an integer multiple m of the Doppler Nyquist sampling interval TD. Now let's look at the spatial domain beamformer. We assume that the transmitter applies m different beamforming vectors to acquire distinct measurements. The receiver at the source vehicle uses a fixed receive combiner vector P throughout the radar channel measurement process. The fixed receive beam allows us to drop the AO estimation problem in our measurement model and focus on joint AOD Doppler estimation for each range bin. The communication receiver of the recipient vehicle uses a unit norm beamforming vector Q. This beamformer Q is set to a spatial match filter of the communication channel to provide maximum transmit received or gain and thereby achieve the highest communication spectral efficiency. Now let's look at the communication and radar received signal model. Within a core and processing interval of T seconds, we assume that the acceleration and the relative velocity of a moving target is small enough to assume constant velocity and that the target is quasi-stationary. In this design, we assume a quasi-omnidirectional reception at the radar receiver, which enables radar scanning mode with no prior knowledge of radar target directions. At the transmit side, we exploit all the transmit antennas during the data transmission mode to construct a narrow coherent beam for communication and constant gain side loops in other directions for radar sensing. We will cover this aspect of transmit recorder design in detail in the later slides. We represent the radar channel as we mentioned as a doubly selective millimeter wave channel. Due to the one-way channel used in communication as compared to the two-way channel used in radars, the delay spread of communication channel is smaller than the radar channel. The delay spread for communication channel further reduces due to the narrow main loop pointing towards the communication receiver at a long distance as compared to the wide side loops used for radar sensing with wide field of view. Therefore, to explore the performance trade-off between communication and radar, we consider an illustrative example of a line of sight frequency flap millimeter wave communication channel between the source and recipient vehicles. Since the focus of this paper is target detection and estimation in the Doppler AOD domain and not in the range angle domain, 
we describe radar signal model for a particular dominant range when with distance d. The same algorithm can be applied to the other range bins. We assume that the range bin of interest consists of a few k virtual target scattering centers. The kth virtual scattering center is described by its Doppler AOD pair Vk and theta k and complex channel attribute hk, which is a product of radar cross section and path loss. After the received beam forming, the cross correlation of the transmit training sequences with the mth received frame echo and assuming perfect cancellation of the data part on the received training signal, the radar received signal corresponding to the training part with an additive noise W of M is given as the equation you can see here. Let's look at the JCR objectives now that we are trying to optimize. On the radar side, we are optimizing normalized mean square error of the radar channel estimate. And on the communication side, we are trying to maximize the communication data rate. But for designing waveform and beamforming for joint communication radar, there is a trade-off between radar channel NMSE and communication data rate. Our focus is to design transmit precoders, FM, for M equal to 1 to M, to achieve a low radar channel NMSE and a high communication data rate. We will cover the optimization in the later slide. So now let's look at the beamforming design for radar sensing in this joint communication radar framework. As mentioned by Professor He, the prior work on beam search-based radar results in huge sensing overhead, as we can see through the animation. So the narrow main loop is used to communicate to the communication receiver. And then we will have another set of uh, beam, which could be used for radar sensing. Because of this exhaustive scanning, the overhead will be huge. And this mode also happens in a beam training mode, which is having a low update rate. Instead of that, we choose the compressed sensing approach in our paper, which reduces the overhead. And also, it is done during the data transmission mode, leading to high radar update rate. How do we design this? Let's go into detail for that. Now, the standard CS-based uh, beamforming design generally involves quasi-omnidirectional beam to acquire spatial channel measurements. These quasi-omnidirectional beams are wide beams, and they do not give enough gain along the direction, uh, which is the desirable direction for communication. The approach that we use in this paper is that we are using a beam with high gain along the communication direction and uniform gain along the rest of the direction which we are using for sensing. And in this paper, we are focusing on short range and medium range sensing, which has a wide field of view, but the range could be small. So the problem is to design a transmit precoder which allows us to get the desired JCR beam pattern with a narrow main lobe beam uh, pointing towards the communication and a constant side lobe in other directions. You can see in the figure that delta is the fraction of the energy in the communication direction, and then one minus delta is being distributed uniformly in the other directions. So our goal is to design a phased array compatible beam former that has the designed uh, desired beam pattern for JCR. Now let's look at the JCR beam former design using GS algorithm uh, to achieve the desired magnitude of uh, delta in the center for the communication and one minus delta distributed across uh, different directions that we discussed on the previous slide. Now, instead of GS algorithm, if we used a naive approach where we apply an inverse DFT over the desired uh, beamformer magnitude, 
we would not be able to incorporate the quantization constraint of p bit phase shifter at the transmitter. So to be able to incorporate that, uh, we use the GS algorithm, which is an alternative projection method. And it helps us to find a sequence which can achieve the DFT magnitude uh, we were talking in the previous slide. So let's look at how it works. First, we initialize the transmit recorder to uh, set off choose sequence. Then we take the DFT of this sequence uh, to enter into the beam space. Now, let me just highlight that the reason we choose the initialization to a Z of two sequence is because we have observed that such an initialization results in a better JCR beam former when compared to using sequences which have a directional beam pattern. Okay, so now let's look at this beam space. Now, we take the DFT phase of this precoder F and do an element-wise multiplication with the desired magnitude uh, that we discussed in the previous slide and to obtain this updated beam pattern. Then we go into this IDFT space, take the phase of the updated beam pattern, multiply it with this constant magnitude desired uh, to obtain the updated precoder vector. And we keep doing this alternating projection for a few iterations to obtain the transmit perturb precoder that would allow us to have the desirable beam former pattern that we talked about in the previous slide. Now in this design, we are exploiting all the antennas to achieve the desirable JCR beam pattern. Unlike the switching one, Professor He discussed in the previous slide, where a few of them is on and the others are off to achieve compressed sensing based radar sensing. This enables higher SNR for radar sensing. Now, Nitil will present a space time sequence design for compressed sensing based GCR. Thank you. Thank you, Preeti. Hi, my name is Nitin Myers, and I'm an assistant professor here at the faculty of 3ME in TU Delft. In this section of the talk, I'm going to construct new space-time codes for compressed sensing based radars in a JCR system. Before I begin, let's first take a look at the system model that Preeti had already gone over. Let's say the JCR transmitter applies a beamformer FM in the mth slow time slot. In this slot, the JCR RX over here acquires a radar measurement YM given by this equation. What I'm going to do in this slide is that I'm going to reduce a lot of notation in this equation and I'll get to something that looks much simpler to play with. First, the term due to Doppler shift, that is this term over here, can be written as the mth entry of a Vandermont vector d of vk. In compact form, it's simply em transpose d of vk, where em is the mth column of an identity matrix, and em transpose d of vk simply samples the mth entry of the vector d of vk, correct? Next, I'm going to pull em transpose out of the summation, and I get that. And finally, I'm going to define everything in this green box as capital H, which is an M cross N space-time radar channel. Note that M is the number of slow time slots in a core and processing interval, and N is the number of antennas at the JCR transmitter. So capital H over here basically encodes both the angle as well as Doppler shift in associated with each and every target in the system. Okay. So in compact form, YM can be written as EM transpose H FM plus WR of M, which is noise. So let's take a look at a typical radar space-time channel at millimeter wave. As you can notice from this figure, the radar channel is really dense in the space-time domain, that is, it has a lot of non-zeros, but its two-dimensional discrete Fourier transform representation, that is H tilde over here, is sparse. Okay. So the sparsity is due to fewer targets in the narrow range pin at wide bandwidths, and it's also because of high scattering at millimeter wave carrier frequencies. Okay. Now, when we have a signal model of this form, that is the measurements are linear projections of the unknown signal, which is capital H over here, and it's also known that this unknown signal, that is capital H, has a sparse representation uh, 
in a certain dictionary, which is the 2D D DFT dictionary in this case. A natural way to solve for H from measurements of this form is to use compressed sensing. So compressed sensing is basically a tool that allows us to estimate sparse high dimensional signals from their lower dimensional representation. Now this is useful because if we go with a compressed sensing based approach, we could reconstruct H from fewer measurements. This means the JCR radar receiver spends lesser time to estimate the channel. Okay, So we end up with lesser time for radar scanning and we could spend the time that we save for other useful things such as communication. Okay, So in our case, the compressed sensing measurement YM is determined by the beam former FM applied at the JCR transmitter. Now from pretty stock, we know that a good JCR beamformer is one that has a good gain along the communication direction and it has close to uniform gain along the remaining directions which are potentially useful for sensing. However, we can't just estimate the angle of departure or the spatial channel with just one JCR beamformer. To estimate the AOD together with the Doppler, the JCR system must apply several transmit beamformers and acquire enough number of spatial measurements to be able to distinguish targets at different AODs. So the question now is, how do we construct a collection of such beamformers that preserve the gain along the communication direction and they have reasonable amount of gain along the remaining sensing directions? So the answer to this question is really simple, it turns out. So the idea is to just circulantly shift the JCR beam F0 that Priti had constructed in the last section and you're going to get a new beam that is good for JCR. And the reason why this works is that circulantly shifting a beam former doesn't change the magnitude of its DFT, which means that the beam pattern sampled on the grid is going to be exactly the same only the phase changes at these different spots over here. Okay. So with this approach, we could get up to n number of good JCR beams by simply circulantly shifting one good JCR beam. And the reason why we get up to n number of such beams is because for this array of size n by 1, f0 is an n cross 1 vector, right? And there are n distinct number of circulant shifts that you could apply to F0 because the dimension of F0 is n, right? So this is going to be our measurement strategy and the rest of the slides are all going to be about designing the sequence of circulant shifts, that is the SMs over here, for better radar channel estimation via compressed sensing. In other words, the focus of this section is not to develop a new compressed sensing algorithm. Rather, we will look at designing new sampling techniques for compressed sensing in radars. As a step towards our design, I'm going to show how the measurements acquired with circular and beamforming can be interpreted as a subsample 2D DFT of a different sparse matrix. So for that, let's first take a look at the signal term in YM, which is EM transverse HFM. As we assume that the JCR beamformer, that is FM, is an S of M circulantly shifted version of F0. We can further simplify this term over here as shown over here, okay? So the way I'm going to do that is by first expressing the space-time radar channel in the 2D DFT representation because we could exploit sparsity over there, all right? And then I'm going to make use of the property of the discrete Fourier transform that circulantly shifting a vector doesn't change the magnitude of its DFT, but it changes the phase of the DFT. And the way it's going to change the phase is by inducing a linear phase modulation, where the slope of the linear phase modulation is proportional to the amount of circulant shift that is applied. Okay. So in this case, the terms in the two purple boxes over here are exactly identical. Okay. So next, we define something called as the masked angle Doppler channel Z tilde, that is basically the original sparse channel H tilde multiplied across the column dimension by F0 tilde, which is basically the discrete beam pattern associated with the JCR beam former F0. Okay, so I'm going to take H tilde 
and I'm going to multiply h tilde along the angle dimension by the discrete beam pattern uh, associated with f0. Okay, so this is how I get from h tilde to z tilde. Okay, so as you can notice here, z tilde is a masked version of the same sparse matrix that we looked at earlier and z tilde has all the information about the targets uh, as you can notice here okay so what we have access to from a measurement model is basically the 2d dft of z tilde which is called as z measured at the location m comma s of m so this measurement strategy is usually called as Fourier compress sensing in the literature because the measurement matrix, the, that is the compress sensing measurement matrix is a subsample Fourier dictionary in this case. Okay. So, and there are a bunch of different techniques uh, that have been well investigated in MRI literature, for example, where the goal is to recover such sparse matrices from the subsample Fourier representation. So let's take a look at the space-time measurement constraint that is very unique to our problem. I'd like to highlight here that this area of two-dimensional Fourier compress sensing has been investigated in the literature, specifically in the context of magnetic resonance imaging. However, the space-time sensing constraint that we have over here is very unique to our radar application and our solution to optimizing compress sensing matrices under this constraint is also very new. So let's get started by just looking at the way we get to measure the sparse signal of interest in our radar application. So we have something called as the masked angle Doppler domain channel, which is Z tilde. It's a sparse matrix that has all the information about the targets. And as we saw in the last slide, what the radar gets to measure is basically the entries from the 2D DFT of Z tilde. So the radar gets to acquire samples from this matrix Z over here. And the catch here is that the radar can acquire only one sample from every row of this matrix Z. And why is it the case? This is because of the measurement model that we have. That is Y of M is Z of M comma S of M plus noise, right? That means if I look at a particular index M along the vertical dimension, I get to choose just one entry from that particular row, that is Z of say M comma S of M, right? And this M over here runs from one to say capital M, M which is the total number of measurements in a coherent processing interval, okay? So why do we have this constraint? It's because the radar can apply just one circling shift of the beam former at a time, okay? So naturally, we get to acquire just one entry from each row of Z. And now I'm going to show you a simple animation that shows one such possible subsampling strategy in the Fourier domain, okay? So as you can notice here, this subsampling strategy basically acquires just one entry from each row, all right? This constraint is very unique to our problem, as I mentioned, and it hasn't been considered in prior work. And the goal of this section is basically to optimize these subsampling locations equivalently the sequence of circle and shifts, that is SMs, for better sparse recovery. Okay? So this is really a challenging problem. Now, coming to the recovery algorithm, you could use any standard recovery algorithm like L1 minimization or OMP, etc. Okay? So it's all about taking the measurements that we get from here in these little boxes and feeding them through a compress sensing algorithm. Okay, that is aware of the sampling locations. Okay? And there's a whole bunch of compression sensing algorithms that can solve this problem and give out an estimate for the sparse signal or equivalently the space-time radar channel. Okay? And as I mentioned, we are not going to talk about compress sensing algorithms because that's pretty much like a solved problem over here. And the main focus is to develop uh, or to construct the sequence for sampling, that is, what is the best sequence of SMs that will help a typical compress sensing algorithm, say like OMP, to achieve better reconstruction, okay? Now, a trivial sampling strategy that one can think of is to sample the entire matrix Z, that is the 2D DFT of Z tilde, okay? 
Now, unfortunately, such an approach is not feasible clearly under the space-time sensing constraint. Okay, so our space-time sensing constraint is basically a constraint that says, well, sample just one entry from each row, right? Now, the next straightforward approach that one can imagine is to acquire samples from Z along a straight line, okay, as shown over here. Now, this clearly meets the sensing constraint of sampling just one entry per row. However, it can be shown that this approach results in substantial aliasing artifacts that cannot be corrected by any compressing algorithm. Okay? So let me just show you what I mean by aliasing artifacts. So uh, this is the original image that we want to estimate. Okay? And we look at the problem in the Fourier domain and we subsample the Fourier representation. Okay? So we know from standard DSP that subsampling a signal results in aliasing artifacts. And the aliasing artifacts over here are so bad okay, that the energy of this target spreads out along the straight line. Okay? So the straight line is basically perpendicular to the sampling line that we have here. Okay? Now this is a big issue because if I use such a sampling strategy with say a greedy algorithm like orthogonal matching pursuit, so such an algorithm basically gets confused. It doesn't know whether the target is at this spot over here or it's at some other spot along this line. Okay? And that's a big problem. So the way to characterize these aliasing artifacts is using the concept of mutual coherence. The mutual coherence of a compressed sensing matrix is a metric that can quantify these artifacts in a way that is related to the compressed sensing matrix A. So I didn't really talk about the compressed sensing matrix in this particular application, but let's say we have a sparse linear model of this form y equals ax plus noise where x is the sparse vector and a is the measurement matrix. So a is called as a compass sensing matrix. The mutual coherence of that matrix is given by mu and it's given by this equation over here. Okay. Now it's well known in compress sensing literature that when the coherence of the compress sensing matrix is really small then the aliasing is going to be small. Okay. Now for this specific case that the compressed sensing matrix in our application is a subsampled Fourier matrix, one can find the mutual coherence associated with a particular subsampling scheme very easily. So we could do that as follows. First, we construct a binary subsampling matrix B that has ones at the locations where we sample the signal of interest, okay, and it has zeros at the other spots. Then the two-dimensional discrete Fourier transform of the subsampling matrix called as a point spread function is constructed. The coherence of the compress sensing matrix as shown over here is basically proportional to the maximum side lobe level of the point spread function. So as you can see from this picture, the coherence for linear subsampling along the straight line over here is really large. And as a result, compressed sensing algorithms would break down over here. In the other case, so uh, if we go with in infeasible sampling under R constraint, that is basically full sampling, B is an all ones matrix, and its 2D DFT is basically a Dirac function, right? So in that case, the point spread function is a Dirac, and the side, maximum side lobe level outside the peak over here is basically zero. So the coherence is zero, which is really ideal for a uh, compress sensing uh, problem, right? So the natural goal in this case is to design compress sensing matrices or equivalently the subsampling strategies that achieve low coherence under our space time uh, subsampling. Now I'm going to formulate an optimization problem to design the subsampling locations. As we've seen in the last slide, our goal here is to minimize the maximum side lobe level of the PSF associated with subsampling. Now to meet the constraint that the subsampling matrix P must have just a single one in every row, we say that the mth row of B is one only in the S of mth spot and it's zero otherwise. For such a B, the PSF can be computed in two stages. 
In the first stage, we perform DFT along every row to get this matrix shown over here. Okay. It basically comprises different rows of the DFT matrix UN, okay, where N is the number of antennas at the JCR TX, right? And these rows are selected according to the circle and shift sequence SMs, okay, all right? Now, let's say we define the second column of this matrix BUN as a sequence GS. Now, clearly, the entries of GS must come from an NPSK constellation where omega is defined as e to the minus j 2 pi over n and this basically comes from the n by n DFT matrix, correct? Now next, to get to the point spread function, we got to apply another DFT operation along each column, right? So when we do that, we get to the PSF that's shown over here. The first co column of the PSF is basically the first column of the identity because the DFT of an all ones vector over here is just one followed by all zeros, right? And the remaining columns of the PSF are basically the M point discrete Fourier transforms of GS raised to powers of one, two, et cetera, up to N minus one, all right? So the PSF has a very specific structure under the space-time sensing constraint, okay? And now let's examine the side lobes of the PSF, that is, the entries of the PSF outside the first spot over here, right? Clearly, the first column of the PSF has n minus one zeros in the side lobe, okay? And the remaining columns of the PSF comprise the discrete Fourier transform of different powers of the sequence GS. Note that GS is something that we've got to design. It depends on the circle and shift supplied at the transmitter. That is something that needs to be optimized. All right. So the coherence minimization problem or the PSF side lobe minimization problem in this case boils down to constructing a sequence GS such that the DFT of all its powers is maximally flat. Okay. So the question is, can we construct such a sequence such that the DFT of GS, GS square, etc. is spread out all over the place and it doesn't achieve a peak at any location, let's say, okay? So when I first looked at this problem, an obvious step was to look at Zadov choose sequences that have this very special property of a constant magnitude discrete Fourier transform. So more interestingly, for the ZC sequence RZC defined over here, one can show that RZC raised to the power of L entry-wise still has a constant magnitude DFT, provided L is co-prime with M, okay? Here M is the length of the sequence, basically. So in the last slide, we were exactly looking for such a sequence. So the idea here is really simple. Just set the sequence to be optimized, that is GS, to RZC, and then figure out what the circle and shifts SM should be. Of course, due to the NPSK constraint on the entries of the sequence GS, this equation works out only under the assumption that the number of slow time slots, that is capital M, is equal to the number of antennas at the JCR transmitter, and also when M is prime. Okay? So when these two conditions are met, we have an optimum solution for the amount of circle and shifts that need to be applied at the JCR transmitter, okay? And our optimized subsampling strategy is shown over here and the corresponding PSF can be observed on the right, okay? As we notice, this approach results in the smallest possible side lobe level under the space-time sensing constraint that we have in the radar application. And this naturally means that our approach would definitely outperform other suboptimal sampling strategies such as the random one shown over here where the side lobe levels are higher. So next, Preeti will discuss how this optimized subsampling method dubbed OCCS outperforms the random approach called RCCS. Okay. So thank you. Thank you, Nitin. Let's dive into how do we adaptively design the JCR waveform beamforming.
and let's look at some of the simulation results. This slide describes adaptive waveform and beamforming design for the JCR framework we discussed earlier. So for this design, we need to understand the radar metric and the communication metric that we will be using. The performance metric for radar that we are using is the normalized mean square error. This is actually a stronger metric than probability of detection for radar target estimation problem because it also captures the phase and magnitude information. This additional information is important for target classification, tracking, and data association. There is actually also a relationship between NMSC and probability of detection metrics. A low NMSC value indicates a high probability of detection. A non-negative NMSC in the logarithmic scale indicates close to zero probability of detection. So without loss of generality, we assume that the average target channel power is one. Then the NMSC metric for a true Doppler angle domain radar channel edge tilde and the estimated Doppler angle domain radar channel edge estimate tilde is defined by this equation. Where let me remind that K is the number of targets, rho is directly proportional to preamble length, and delta is directly proportional to communication SNR. So larger the rho is, the better it is for radar sensing, worse it is for communication, and for delta it is reverse. The larger the delta is, better the communication performance is, and worse is the radar sensing performance. We also will see in future a slides that NMSC is approximately inversely proportional to net SNR, which is a function of rho and delta. Then let's look at the communication performance metric. Now, the widely used communication performance metric is spectral efficiency. But here is the thing. We are trying to actually optimize rho and delta for the adaptive millimeter wave automotive JCR combined waveform beamforming design. This requires the use of a comparable metric to accurately quantify both radar and communication system performances. To use an effective scalar communication metric that panders the concept of radar NMSE for JCR waveform design optimization, we use an effective distortion MSE communication metric analogous to the distortion metric in the rate distortion theory, which is defined as here. It is a function of 2 raised to minus R effective, where R effective is actually a function of rho and delta. And we know that effective spectral efficiency actually varies linearly with rho and logarithmically with delta for the system model we have described in this paper. Now let's go to the weighted average optimization JCR design. So optimizing the rho and delta for communication and radar performances is actually a multi-objective problem. And the scalarization approach is known to achieve a Pareto optimal point for multiple convex objectives. Therefore, the JCR performance optimization can be formulated as the weighted average of a convex hull of communication and radar MSC performance metrics that we can see described here. T is the CPI duration, K is the number of targets, and D is the distance. And we are optimizing this over a set of rho and delta, where rho is between zero and capital P, which is the maximum number of preambles it can support, and rho will be, uh, and delta will be between zero and one. So let us look at the results for precoder design for uh, the GS-based beamformer design we discussed earlier and the switching JCRs where we actually turn off a few of the transmit antennas to get random side lobes, which can then later be used for compress sensing based uh, radar target estimation. So here we can see that the blue one, which is for the ideal communication, where all the power is transmitted towards the communication direction. Here we can see it is achieving the highest gain. And then the lowest gain is actually the switching JCR. So our proposed JCR is actually achieving the 
uh, communication transmit power better than the switching JCR by 1 dB. And then when we look at the side lobes, the CCS based uh, transmit recorder is giving us like constant side lobes. And when we use the switching JCR, we can see that it is actually having random side lobes. So at some of the angles, there could be really low SNR. And if we don't have enough snapshot, which is a problem in joint communication radar, then we might not be able to estimate the targets in those directions. So we see that CCS JCR achieves higher main lobe gain and more constant side lobe than switching JCR. Now, when we look at the radar performance results for the framework we decided earlier and the optimization we just described, we can see that the left side of the plot shows the graph of NMSC versus the SNR, which is the radar performance uh, with respect to signal to noise ratio. And then on the right side, we show the result for NMSC versus target count. That is the number of targets that we have. And we can see that the radar NMSC actually generally decreases with SNR linearly in the logarithmic scale. However, we kind of see the saturation effect at high, uh, the high SNR when the target count is large. Then on the right hand side, we see that OCCS JCR is performing the best followed by RCCS JCR and the worst is the RSJCR, similarly is also on the left side. The other thing that we observe is that the performance gap between RCCS and OCCS JCR actually increases with SNR and the number of targets. But it decreases with M, which is the number of frames within a coherent processing interval. So to conclude this slide, it's like OCCS JCR, which is the optimized one, performs the best for radar channel estimation in Doppler angle domain. So having established that, now we will look into the joint communication radar trade-off and how good are we achieving the radar NMSC, how is rho and delta being selected for the OCCS JCR, where uh, the subsampling is being optimized. Okay, so let's look at the optimal JCR design results now. So on the left top, we see the radar NMSC versus communication DMSC trade-off curve, and it's being plotted for different values of delta and rho. Um, and then the red dotted lines is actually the convex hull. The black line is lower envelope of the convex hull, which is actually the Pareto optimal curve. And on the right, uh, sorry, on the bottom left corner, we see the optimal radar NMSC for different communication ratings, different SNRs, different number of frames, different number of targets. And we see that as we increase the communication rating, the radar NMSC becomes poor. And around omega C of equal to one, uh, it is actually approaching to zero, so it's not usable. But when omega C, which is the communication rating, is closer to zero, radar NMSC is really good. So we can conclude here that with uh, OCCS JCR, the communication uh, data rate could be lost only a little bit, but the radar performance could be significantly improved. Then if we look at how the delta and rho uh, changes with respect to communication rating on the right side top, we see that uh, as the communication rating increases, the delta increases, whereas the rho decreases. And the optimal rho and delta remains same uh, almost for different signal to noise ratios at low and high communication ratings as we have highlighted in the figure. An interesting fact is optimal rho decreases faster than the increase in optimal delta with respect to communication rating for a large number of frames. And the reason is uh, because of how NMSC and DMSC is related to rho and delta, as I explained in the earlier slide. So from all these curves, we can see that the OCCS JCR is actually achieving 
desirable medium and short range radar performance with a wide field of view at the cost of only a small loss in data rate, which is a remarkable result for automotive radar application. So in summary, we uh, proposed OCCS JCR, which exploited all the transmit antennas to generate a narrow coherent beam towards the communication receiver node direction and constant gain side loops in other directions for radar sensing. Unlike switching based JCR, where we turned some of the transmit antennas off, that leads to the reduction in SNR. We also employed a few circular shifts of the transmit beam format that we designed using GS algorithm and applied two dimension partial Fourier compressed sensing technique for radar sensing. Then we also optimized these circular shifts to achieve minimum coherence in compressed sensing because we have a limited number of frames and limited number of antenna elements. We proposed weighted MSE average based waveform beamforming design, where we use the NMSC metric for radar and DMSC metric for communication under the constraints like we have uh, uh, the rho, which is function of preamble length between zero to maximum P and delta, which is between zero to one. And we showed in our results that using OCCS JCR, which is better than RCCS JCR, where we are not optimizing the circular shifts, and also compared to RS JCR, which is the switching based JCR, OCCS JCR performs the best. And it also actually achieves the automotive radar sensing requirement for medium range and short range uh, sensing um, with just a small reduction in communication rate. Thank you. Thank you once again for attending this webinar. Before I conclude, I would like to advertise some open positions in our respective research teams. At TU Delft here in the Netherlands, I'm currently seeking to hire two PhD students and a postdoc in the area of radar signal processing. And at NCSU, Professor Heath is looking for PhD students to work in MIMO communication theory and advanced antennas. Feel free to reach out to us if you are interested in any of these positions. And we hope to hear from some of you very soon. Thank you.